Do you remember who first welcomed you in a place like this? Before you ever heard about God's love, who showed you genuine kindness the first time that you stepped foot into a Bible study, a student gathering, or a worship experience? And how did that warmth and acceptance affect the way you responded to the story of salvation? And did you ever think about who welcomed that person? Who did for them what they did for you? And who welcomed the person who welcomed the person who welcomed you? You get the idea, right? We all have a spiritual ancestry of welcome. When we help someone belong in a community of believers, we play a vital part in their steps toward faith. It's so simple. Our welcome can actually help a person find God. So I wanted to start off this morning with that video for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it, obviously it's all about in welcoming people and inviting people. And next uh, Sunday on Easter, we have an incredible opportunity to do that. Um, I, I was on the internet not too long ago, and I read this statistic that said that, you know, 83% of people who don't go to church would respond if someone would just invite them to, to come with them. Of course, I was also on the internet, and I read this quote from Abraham Lincoln that said, you shouldn't trust every statistic you read on the internet. Um, <laughs> But, but the, the idea is simple, right? There are a lot of people that we know that for some reason, when it comes to the major events in the church's life, Christmas and Easter, uh, they're really open to coming and joining us. So on your seats or in the seats around you, there are these invitation cards that have the service times and information. would encourage you to take these with you and, and use them as part of a conversation to invite someone to join you, to, to come and attend with you. So don't, don't just like stick it under people's windshield wipers or cram it in their car or anything like that. That makes Jesus cry and you don't want to do that. Um, but instead, just use this as a way to actually open up a conversation and just see, see what God does. Uh, the other reason that I wanted to show that video is, is it, it kind of gets at the idea we're talking about today of this idea of, of welcome and being welcomed in a place. And, and that got me thinking, have, is it just me or have you guys ever been in a situation where it was just really clear that nobody wanted you to be there? Like you just really weren't welcomed? So that's just me. Good. Because <laughs> I'm kind of feeling that right now. Um, uh, no, no. So the example that I think about that was the time when I helped Ronald McDonald move. Um, no, it's true. So when I was in college, I dated a girl who, whose dad, and I'm not kidding about this, her dad was Ronald McDonald. Okay, he was a professional clown. That's what he did for his job. He was the, the Ronald McDonald for the central Ohio region. So he spent his life sort of going to these different McDonald's events and corporate events, things like that. Um, and, and here's the thing. Uh, Ronald McDonald hated me. And that's not right. <laughs> because Ronald McDonald is supposed to like everybody. Um, but it's true, he hated me. For some reason, he had this idea that I, quote, wasn't good enough for his daughter, um, which is honestly true. We were, we were kind of like oil and water. We, we brought out the worst in each other. And in a lot of ways, I'm glad that relationship ended, and I actually grew up some before I met my amazing wife, Martha. But for, for the sake of the story today, what you need to know is that, that Ronald McDonald hated me. I say it still gives me nightmares still just seeing this guy. <laughs> it's like I think he was the clown from It now that I think about it. Um, but, but so there's this time when Ronald McDonald is moving, right? They're moving from one house in town to another house, and I thought, this is my chance. This is my chance. There's a bunch of us from college. We'll go up there together, and I'm going to win her parents over by being such a helpful guy. Um, so we, we go up. A whole group of us goes up there to help him move. And the highlight of the weekend for me is that I'm, I'm bringing some stuff into the master bedroom closet, and there, hanging on the rack in front of me, three full Ronald McDonald suits which, of course, I tried on. Um, but that, that was kind of the, the only, really the only highlight. The, the rest of the weekend was just pretty awful because her parents just bent over backwards to, to make sure that I knew that I wouldn't welcome there. So some examples of that. There, there was a whole group of us that came up from college to help them move. Um, everybody else got to stay in their house, and I had to stay with a neighbor. At one point, they decided, you know what would be great? Let's get a, a picture of the whole gang that came up to, to sort of help us move. Mike, why don't you take the picture so that you won't be in it? This is what they actually said. And then, then the worst part, there's this evening, we've been moving all day, and, and her dad's in the living room kind of flipping through the channels, and I'm like, this, this, this is it. This is my moment. So I go in, and I sit down, and I'm like, well, sir, I'm, I'm so glad we have this opportunity to spend some time together because, you know, I've, I've been dating your daughter for a while, and now just, th this is an opportunity for you, you to get to know me. He said, no. I think we know everything we need to know about you. 
And he did it without even looking at me. He did it while he's flipping the channels, right? And it was just like, oh, God, this is just terrible. So anyway, all that to say, <laughs> it's pretty clear when we're not welcome in a place sometimes, right? And that's not what we want to be as a, as a church. This morning, we're, we're finishing up this sermon series where we've been talking about some of the really core values and principles that guide us as a church. So if you're here this morning and you're a, a guest or you're visiting with us, you really picked a good day to come. Because in this series, we've been pulling back the curtain and, and talking about really what we think matters to God and what matters to us. So it gives you a, a chance to get to know our heart. And, and where this came from, a few weeks ago, the staff and the elders had a chance to get away for our our annual planning retreat, and we kind of stacked hands on these things. It's sort of, these are the things we're really driving at this year. And, and the great thing about these is that these aren't new for Suburban. These are all things, being biblical, biblically based, inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. They're, they're all things that have been a part of Suburban's history from the very beginning. And, and this morning, we're kind of finishing up this series by talking about the last of the ideas on that list, the idea of, of really offering radical hospitality, really offering this incredible welcome to other people. So to dig into that, what I want to invite you guys to do, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Use, you know, whatever format of Bible you brought, electronic, paper, you name it. Um, if you're here this morning and you didn't bring a Bible with you, or maybe you're new to the faith, you're, you're kind of new to Bibles, you're not sure how to find passages in them, that's perfectly okay. Um, somewhere in the seats around you, there's a red Bible. You can grab it and turn to the page number that's on the screen there, and we'll all kind of be on the same place. But, but as you're turning there, I'm going to actually have the ushers come back, and they're going to help me by passing out some things. So what we're going to pass out to you guys are some Lego blocks, okay? It's officially playtime at, at Suburban this morning. So the, the ushers are going to pass some baskets down. Yes, yeah, somebody's like, yeah! <laughs> Here's the bad news. You only get two of them, okay? So we're going to pass these baskets down, and I want everybody to take two Lego blocks. And a little bit later, we'll talk about what we want to do with them, but I guess in the meantime, if you get bored, you can build like a very small tower or something like that with them. Um, but we'll grab those blocks and, and pass it on. So let me give you a little bit of background on the passage that we're going to be looking at. So this passage, it's in 1 Thessalonians. It's part of an ongoing conversation between an early Christian leader named Paul and this sort of young group of, of Christians in the Greek city-state of Thessalonica. And we know it's part of an ongoing conversation because we actually have two different letters that he wrote to them. And, and this passage is in the first one. So he's in this letter and he's kind of talking about um, the time he's reflecting back on some time that he spent when he was physically present with them. He spent some time in Thessalonica getting to know them, telling them about God, starting the church. And in this passage, he's sort of reflecting on the time he spent with them and kind of the, the quality of his interaction with them during that time. So I just want to read this, uh, starting in verse 5, and want you guys to listen. And as you listen, really kind of keep your eyes and your ears open for language that talks about hospitality and welcome and, and that kind of thing. And we'll, we'll drill down on that in a moment. So it says this. It says, You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from any human being, not from you or anyone else. Even though, as apostles of Christ, we could have assert, asserted our prerogatives. Boy, prerogatives is a hard word to say. Um, instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Now, there's a lot in this passage, I think, that kind of points us towards this idea of welcome and hospitality. But where I want to start is really sort of in that last line right there. It says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. You see, for Paul, when he's talking about what it, it looks like to really welcome people in, to really welcome people into relationship and into the family of faith and into a relationship with God, it goes way beyond just sort of a handshake and a, hey, how are you, hello, at the door. It even goes beyond, you know, inviting somebody over for dinner, though those are wonderful, important first steps. No, for Paul, the, the, the core of this idea of sort of radical hospitality is not just getting to know somebody. It's actually sharing your life with them, right? It, it's opening yourself up in, in sort of unique ways to do life together, to invite people into the details of your life just as you're invited into the details of their lives, really journeying together on, on this faith journey and sharing the details of life together. There's sort of this depth of relationship that's expressed there. 
And what Paul is saying is part of the reason that I was able to share the gospel with you is because I welcomed you into that kind of relationship. And it's interesting because he talks a little bit about his motivations. You know, why is it that he does that? Because, you know, he's thinking, well, maybe people think I'm just buttering you up or it was flattery or I'm just after your money or something like that. And Paul is really clear at the beginning of this passage, that's not what he was about. He wasn't just trying to flatter people. He wasn't, you know, trying to just get other people to give him a pat on the back and be like, wow, you just really did a good job with this, Paul. I mean, you're, you're just really a good guy. No, for him, the motivation is love. Right? It's all about love. It's just like we talked about in the prayer and in, in Adam's communion meditation and the offering. God offered this love to us. God welcomed us in. And Paul understands that. He understands that all of his life should be a response to that. So he says, because of this great love that God gave us that I have for you, we were delighted to not just share the gospel with you, but to share our lives as well. And as I mentioned, you know, these things, this idea of radical hospitality, sharing life, this has been a part of Suburban's DNA from the very beginning. Um, you know, for my wife and I, as, as we were getting to know you guys as we moved here a few months ago, we have definitely experienced this as a family, uh, this sort of rich and warm welcome. In a welcome that goes beyond just like, hey, do you need some help getting your boxes off the truck? Or, you know, hey, do, do you know where the grocery store is? No, we've, we've really been humbled in the way that the, the people of Suburban in this community have been willing to, to kind of open up their lives to us and, and to invite us in, in in really profound ways. And it's not just what we've experienced. I mean, we see you doing this for others as well. You know, we're just sort of amazed with the way that you pray for each other, that, that you encourage each other, in the way that as a church you, you come alongside families, even families that aren't part of the church, in, in times of need, and you support them with uh, you know, meals or encouragement or whatever that might be. I mean, think about the preschool that we have up here. A lot of those families are, don't have a Christian background. A lot of them don't come to church. But when needs come up, the, the families of that preschool, the staff of that preschool, they offer this incredible radical hospitality of really sharing life and partnering and walking with those families in their struggles. It's something that as a church, we've done this incredibly well over the years. Or, or I think about foster care and adoption. I mean, Martha and I have talked about this numerous times. We have never been a part of a church community where there are so many people who have literally opened up their lives, opened up their homes to others through foster or through adoption. We've never been a part of a community where there's so many people who support families who are welcoming people in through foster care or adoption. I mean, as a church, Suburban has always been willing to do this, to share life with each other, to not just sort of shake somebody's hand at the door and say, okay, we can check hospitality off the list, we got it done. But no, it goes so much deeper than that. And it sort of grows out of the example that Paul is giving us in this passage. Because really, part of that, that strength we want to build on in the year to come is how do we continue to do that? How do we continue to really radically welcome people in by doing life together with them, sharing life with them? But Paul, as he's talking about this, I, I think there's so much richness in this passage. There, there are other things that we can notice as well. So if you can, turn your attention back to the, the second part of verse 7 where he says this. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children so we cared for you right just as a nursing mother cares for her children so we cared for you I, I think that is one of the most tender and arresting images in the entire bible and it is absolutely crazy to me that it's coming from the mouth of a single dude right i mean paul is this unmarried like 50 year old man and, and he's talking about his relationship with the thessalonians and he says guys do you know what it's like the way I interacted with you, it is just like the way that a nursing mother interacts with her child. Now, that's amazing that he says that. And, and just think about that. Think about moms with babies. Right? Think about what all is involved in that. Right? Obviously, there's this incredible love. There's this incredible affection. I think there's also this incredible amount of patience. Right? And there's this incredible willingness, especially on the part of the mom, to be inconvenienced so that that baby can grow and thrive. I mean, I think about our kids when they were sort of nursing uh, diaper age. It was not always convenient to take care of them, right? Like, they had their own timetable, and it was very different than our timetable. Um, but both of us, I mean, really Martha and me once or twice over the course of about 10 years, we were really willing to get up in the middle of the night and be with them and, and help them because that's what moms do, right? That's, that's the nature of that relationship. They're willing to take on this incredible personal inconvenience in order to be in a place where their child gets what they need to really grow and thrive. And that's what Paul is saying. He says that, that's a part of this radical hospitality as well. It's not just sharing life. It's sharing life in such a way where you are willing to really be inconvenienced 
so that this other person can grow and thrive and blossom and be what God is calling us to do. And, and that's what I think we as a church need to keep in mind as we move forward this year. As we continue to focus on this idea of radical hospitality, we have to remember um, that that's going to involve sacrifice sometimes. It's going to involve inconvenience at times, but it's going to be worth it because of the result that God can do in people's lives through that. Right, so it may be inconvenient. We may need to sacrifice some of our time or our energy or our money or sharing our education. Sometimes it means we sacrifice our preferences. Right? We don't get exactly what we want exactly at the time we want it, just like a mother would do for their child because the end result is worth it, because we want to see that child thrive. And again, as a, as a church, this is something that we have just really done well over the years. It's a strength to build on. I mean, think about our worship services, for example. I mean, if you've been at Suburban for a long time, you know that they've changed pretty dramatically over the years. So at times, we might sing different songs than we used to. We might talk about things differently than we used to. We might take a different tone than we used to because the idea is that we really want to welcome people in where they are. Right? For us, the driving goal in worship is always going to be, what do we do to help people focus on God? Because it's always focused on God. But how do we do that in such a way that everybody who comes whether they've never been to church or they're here all the time, how do we do it so that everybody comes has the very best opportunity to understand what's going on and to really engage with what's going on? Again, that's why I thought it was so wonderful the way Adam set up communion and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what it means. You know, if communion is not something that you want to participate in today, that's okay, right? Just let the plates go on by. Right? It's just acknowledging the fact that in this room, we've got people who are in very different places in their understanding of God, and that's okay. We want to welcome you just as you are, and we want you to engage in every part of our service in a meaningful way as you feel prepared and ready to do that. And you know, when I think about worship services and ways that we use those to welcome people in, I mean, I see Lane Heathcote down here, and I just think about her daughter, Chanel. Um, I don't, Chanel's not here this service with us. She's sick today? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. But think about Chanel, right? Chanel is a, a young woman with some significant disabilities. And, and yet, over the years, this church has found a place so that she's often here for the 9.30 and the 11 o'clock service for the music. And she simply comes up to the front and, and dances. And I just remember when Martha and I visited this church for the first time, we were sitting right back there, kind of trying to fly under the radar. And it was just incredibly moving to say, oh my gosh, there's a place at this church. That they're willing to make this worship service set up in such a way that there's a place for her to express herself as she feels able. And again, I just think the way that this church over the years has, has encountered and welcomed in people with very differing disability, it, that is just an incredible example of what you all have done, of truly being welcoming in this way, of caring for people just like a nursing mom does, right? They know their children individually. They advocate for them. They fight for them to have a place where they can engage. So whether it's things like Night to Shine or whether it's some of the, the groups that we host here during the week, or whether it's simply creating the space and the fact that it's okay in worship uh, for people to come and engage as they best can. It's just an incredible strength of this place. It's an incredible example of welcome, and it's something that we want to continue to build on in the year to come, even if that's inconvenient for us at times, because we believe that's part of what it means to follow God. Right, so this, this idea of radical hospitality, it, it involves sharing life. It involves uh, kind of taking on those inconveniences that a nursing mom would take on. But it's crazy because Paul keeps going, right? He's got some other things he wants to say about hospitality in this passage. So let's jump back in at verse 9 and see what he says here. He says, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Right, so, so Paul has just been talking about how the way he interacted with these people was just like a mom, and now he kind of flips the metaphor around, and he says, oh yeah, so I was kind of like a mom with you guys, but I also was kind of like a dad with you guys as well. I was like a dad in the sense that I worked. I worked hard. I worked hard in order to be able to provide for you all and, and to put myself in a position where I could encourage you and challenge you and help you move towards the future that God has for you. 
right? For Paul, part of this thing about radical hospitality it involves sort of being willing uh, to actually provide for others, to share what we have with others, and working hard to be able to do that. And again, you see this in, in the way he sets things up. And, and again, I think for him, the reason he does this is because he sees this in the very heart of God. His life is a response to what God has done. You see that every step of the way. And he realizes that God was willing to work hard for us, to sacrifice for us, so that we could be in a position where we're able to respond to his love. That's, that's part of what we talked about as far as Palm, Fri or Palm Friday, <laughs> Palm Sunday goes. Um, yeah, I actually did go to seminary at one time, I promise. Um, <laughs> but if you think about it, that's, that's part of hospitality as well. Right? When you welcome somebody into your house, you, you give them a nice dinner, you got to work to make that happen. You work to clean the house. You work to be able to buy the food, to give this gift for them. And you do that so that they'll feel welcome. And we as a church do that. We work and we share our resources in order to welcome people in so that we can then be in a place where we can encourage them to move towards the life that we believe that God has for every single one of us. And again, as a church, this is something that Suburban has just done incredibly well over the years. Um, I think about the international student community here in Corvallis as one example of that. Uh, a lot of you guys know there are lots and lots of international students who show up at Oregon State every year. And a number of those international students, when they come over, they come over with their families. And, you know, they land, they get off the plane, they make it to Corvallis, um, and they've got a place to live. There's student housing, there's an apartment set up. But those places aren't furnished because it is really hard to fit a sofa in your carry-on luggage. Um, but they're here, and, and I just think about all of the different ways over the years that Suburban has, has sacrificed financially to sort of provide a welcome to them. You know, whether it's putting together gift baskets to sort of stock pantries or help them have something when they settle, or buying furniture or donating furniture to furniture fairs where they can come and pick some things out. Uh, because having those things, our sacrifice, gives them an opportunity to make that apartment actually feel like home while they're here. And, and there's so many other examples of ways that, that people in this church community have sacrificed over the years, financially, with their time, their energy, whatever, to, to meet the needs of other people again, to make them feel welcome, to, to help them know that there is a community that loves and cares that they are, are, are able to be a part of. So that's just a part of who we are. Or it's part of who we are as a Christian community because it's a part of, of God's heart is this radical hospitality. It's a part of what we have been called to do as well, and we want to continue to do that moving forward. But the, the million-dollar question that I want to ask this morning is this. I mean, it, it's part of what we're called to do. It's part of what we've done. But I just want you to sort of think with me and try to imagine what, what, what might stop us from doing this? I mean, this is something we want to focus on in the year to come. We're putting some time and energy and resources behind it. But what are the barriers that could get in the way? What might prevent us from actually doing the things that God is calling us to do and offering this radical hospitality? And the answer to that, believe it or not, is in the Legos that you guys have been playing with for the last 20 minutes. Um, so here's what I want you to, to think about with that. So go ahead and pull out one of your, one of your Legos and, and look at this, right? Every Lego has a limited number of places that it can connect with other Legos, right? Like this is a two by three Lego brick, so there's six places on the top, six places on the bottom. So the most possible pieces that this Lego could connect with would be 12 others. It's got 12 points of connection, and once those are full, they're full, right? There, there's no other way to connect to that. And here's the thing, one of the wonderful things about a church like Suburban is that people here have a depth of relationship, right? Suburban's been around for 60 years. A lot of people have been in this church for a long time. Their friends are here. They see faces they recognize on Sunday morning. We're in small groups together, and we serve together, and there's this real depth of relationship there. But one of the things that I think happens in our busy 21st century American lives is that it's really easy for us to live with all of our connections filled up. Right? I mean, that's just how life goes. We've got friends. We've got family. We've got people we're connected to. We've got the folks at work. Right? The connections are all filled up, and we just don't have space or bandwidth to add anybody else. And I think especially in a church like Suburban that's been around for a long time, it's an incredible strength that we have these strong relationships with each other. That's part of what helps us thrive. But potentially, that's a real liability when it comes to welcoming people in. Because a lot of us have known each other for so long and are connected to so many other people here in such deep ways that when somebody new shows up and somebody new hears about God and wants to be here and wants to get connected, we run the risk of them seeing our church this way. 
right, as this solid wall of Lego blocks where everybody is already connected to everybody else, where everybody else has all the connections they need, and there's just no way to connect. There's no empty spaces, right? There's nowhere that they can get locked into the larger group. And that's a challenge, right? It's not good or bad. It just, it just is what it is. But that, I think, is the challenge that we have to face moving forward as a church. And, and I'm not sort of showing this picture or saying these things to try to make anybody feel guilty, right? The goal of today is just to talk about this is part of what God has for us. Part of the life that we have as we follow God is this balance of being connected with others and healthy relationships in life-giving ways, but also trying to figure out, okay, how do we as individuals, as families, as a church, how do we stay connected to others in life-giving ways but also have opportunities to welcome new people in? That's an ongoing tension that we've got to manage that we have to be aware of. So what I want to challenge you to do this week is to spend some time thinking about that. Um, if you look in the little sheet in the middle of your bulletin, the sermon notes, there's just some questions that we put in there. And what I want to ask you to do is take 10 or 15 minutes this week and simply stop and think through these questions prayerfully and just, just think, okay, what is it that maybe God is wanting you to do with what you've heard this morning? Again, it's not, not trying to make you feel guilty. We're all in different stages of life and, and have different bandwidth for connecting with others. But really just think about some of these things. I mean, for you, if your life is pretty full, kind of look at question number one. You know, it says, well, who do we already run into in our regular routines that we could spend a little more time getting to know? And, and what's one question we could ask them that would help us express care to them? Right, if your life is already pretty full, yeah, chances are good that you've got normal routines that you go through. There's already people that you see. They're your neighbors. They're your coworkers. It's the checker at the grocery store that you see every week when you go through. We've already got some people that maybe are kind of connected to just a tiny little corner of our Lego, and they're already there. But just ask God, is maybe that a relationship that you're wanting to build on as we move forward? What, what might that look like? Or maybe you just really feel convicted and you think, okay, God, I, I need to open up some more spaces on my Lego. What's it look like to do that? What are some decisions that I can make that help create space so that I can connect with other people who really need to connect around here to, to plug into that life-giving connection? Or maybe for you, the stage of life that you're in right now, your Lego is full, and that's okay because that's what God is calling you to do. So maybe your role isn't to connect other people to yourself, but maybe your role is to show up every Sunday morning with an eye open to people who aren't connected and with an eye to some people that you already know here who've got some empty spots, and your job is to just try to help them connect those dots. You're not connecting them to you. You're trying them to connect with each other. Right? There are a lot of different ways that God is calling us to individually be a part of this work of welcoming people in. But really, the one thing I want you to do this week, and, and this is the thing where I'm like, man, if, if, if this happens every week, I feel like I've actually done my job as a pastor, is this last question. What is one thing that God is calling you to do this week with what you've heard today, right? That, that's the goal. If, if we can all leave with just one thing in mind that God is calling us to do, with one practical step that we can take, and we actually do it, boy, as a church, we move into the mission that God has for us. And then the goal is to come back the next week and say, okay, God, what's the next right step? And once we take that one as a group, we say, okay, God, what is the next right step? So I just want to encourage you to really think about that this week as we pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning and to, to just begin to ask some of these questions. We are, are so grateful for the way that we have all been welcomed in. I mean, everybody who's here who feels like this is their church home, God, we are only here because at some point somebody made space for us. Somebody opened up some space to invite us in. And God, it is a privilege to be able to offer that to others. So, Lord, in this week to come, we just pray that you would open up our eyes to see what we need to do with what we have heard today. God, all we can do is listen to you and try to take the next right step. And once we've done that, we just open ourselves up and say, God, what is my next right step? And we trust that in your goodness and in your power, you can do what you alone can do. You can come to a, a room of this size with this many people in so many different places in life. And you can meet each of us where we are. And step by step, you can lead each of us to where we need to be. So God, I just pray that through the power of your spirit, you would do that this week. That you would lead us and you would give us the guts to follow. Amen.